So I am actually the one New Relic person that is not from San Francisco. I'm from Portland, uh, which is great because it rains there all the time. So I just came over here and I was like, no change. The buses are a little taller. We're fine. Uh, so yes, my it was originally called in flesh structure, and everyone was like, do not. What is wrong with you? So it could be worse. I always welcome feedback for my talks, but since we don't have any tomatoes, if you want to yell at me in real time, you can find me on Twitter at Alice Goldfuss. And let's kick this off with getting the boring stuff out of the way. So I'm Alice. I'm a site reliability engineer at New Relic, and here is a picture of me during my last on-call. <clears throat> so this is usually the slide where I tell you what New Relic is. Hopefully you already know what New Relic is. So if you want something interesting, I'll tell you a little bit about our data ingest here. We actually have some pretty cool technologies. We are using Cassandra, which isn't that new, but we're also using Kafka, and we've been running Docker in production for two years now. So if you want to bug me about that, I'd be happy to talk afterwards. But for the purposes of this talk, all you need to know about New Relic for this talk is a year ago, our operations team looked like this, and now it looks like this. Plus more. <clears throat> we more than doubled in a year, and we are now some 30 engineers supporting over 200 developers across different cities, states, and time zones. That's very exciting, but also really unstable. And our meat for structure wasn't really capable of handling that at first, which of course brings up that age-old question that historians and scholars have been pondering for years. What is meat for structure? I know, I learned about it in history class too. So meat for structure is what your architecture runs on. It's what your engineering runs on. It's not hardware, it's not AWS, it's not that box running Gen 2 you found in the woods. It is your people. Because at the end of the day, your people are the ones that picked out your technologies, installed them, and are gonna fix them when they break at 3 a.m. And if those people don't have processes in place to keep them reliable and happy, everything is going to crumble. So meat for structure is what is important here because without a stable foundation there, nothing else matters. So like I said, uh, we were a bit unstable at first. It basically represented this, a bit cringeworthy. And I'm hoping that the lessons we learned will be helpful for you today. I broke this talk up into five topics that I named after vaguely technical terms because I was originally submitting this to Usenix's Lisa, and I thought it would get accepted if it looked more technical. And it did, so note to self, do that. Let's get started with enable logging. Who here knows what the bus factor is? Show of hands? OK. So the bus factor, according to like a Wikipedia definition, is the number of engineers that you can lose before a project or a feature has to halt and blah, blah, blah. Basically. How many people on your team can you lose by getting hit by a bus before you no longer have that knowledge that you need to move forward? Most teams have a bus factor of maybe one or two, and that is not good at all, and you want to raise that bus factor. And how do you do that? Well, you need to move from an oral to a written culture. And I made this the first point because it is the most difficult to pull off, and it is the most important one, because if you don't have this, nothing else is going to work. It's a lot easier when you're three people in a basement and something breaks and you turn to the person next to you and you go, did you break that? And they're like, yeah. And then you're just like, fix it and you go to lunch. But when there's dozens of you spread out across different offices, if you don't have that communication in place, everything starts to crumble. So you need to move from oral to written. You need to write it all down. So here's a story time just to kind of kick us off. <clears throat> a couple of months ago, one of our internal LDAP servers took a dirt nap. It was about 9 p.m. and most of our applications were fine except for good old Jenkins, which had been set up with only one LDAP server and it happened to be that one. So suddenly no one could auth in to run builds and security was not happy about that. So I was of course available now. I SSH'd into the box itself, deleted the auth section and the creds and everyone could get in. But in my haste, I forgot to actually write down what those creds were, good job me, and I couldn't get it set up again. Luckily, the engineer that put them into place wrote a very specific step-by-step -step doc, a run book of how he was going to apply them, and I looked that up, and I found the creds and applied them, and no one else had to get woken up, and it was fine. But I needed that written down. I needed that knowledge to be shared. 
Now when I say write it all down, I mean everything. I don't just mean maintenance tasks and network topologies, although you should write those down too. I mean everything that's important for your engineers to succeed. What is your team's mission? How, what are your chosen tools and methodologies? If I came onto your team and I only knew Chef, but you were a puppet shop, how would I know that except if someone told me? Where can I look at that and why we chose Puppet and what our basic rollout strategy is for Puppet? And then standard practices and procedures, like what is your PTO policy? What are your sick days policy? How do people attend conferences? How did you get permission to come to this summit today? Was that written down somewhere? Or is that just something you happen to know? The right person nudged you and told you to come? They should be written down because then less people have to be asked. It's just right there. Everyone on your team should feel empowered to ask for help to make it a living FAQ. You should factor in time into your tickets or your tasks for documentation. And people on your team, everyone should feel comfortable in writing and asking for docs. If someone just released a new internal app, I should be able to look at that person and say, hey, Where's the readme for that? And they should be able to be like, oh, either they wrote it or let me write that for you. Everyone should be supportive. And if you're a manager, you really need to bring that from the top down so that people know it's expected of them. If you're a lead, even if you're a junior, hearing that from all angles really makes it a cultural thing and makes it expected. And you have to give people the support they need to actually write it down. So I'm actually going to give you some homework for each of these points. Sorry. How can you ship this in your culture? How can you either write it all down or start to eliminate that bus factor? Well, you can do more pair programming. This is an excellent representation of pair programming in that it is two birds on a barbed wire fence screaming. And you should do more of that, the, you know, all of that, the screaming especially, because I mean, I don't know if you've ever pair programmed, but hmm. But it's still good. And sometimes people think of pair programming as a strictly developer thing, working on the same code base. But on an operations level, you should pair program as well on different tasks. Even if you're doing a simple network change, you know, adding a VLAN or something, or a database change, you should cross-pollinate your teams. <clears throat> because if you have a DBA that doesn't know anything about networking, and you're doing a routine network change, have them sit with you and teach them that skills. And then that's more helpful for them. That spreads that knowledge around, especially if they're doing a new failover point between their master-slave setup. Now if that happens to fail while they're on call, they might not need to wake you up, because they already know how it was set up. And that starts to build secondary skill sets and really start to pad up that bus factor. So moving on to pipe to standard out. So congratulations, you got everyone writing things down. But you have an incident, some servers crash, and you need everyone on your team to start writing down their investigations into a root cause. So where do they do that? Well, engineer number one writes in your internal wiki. Engineer number two does a shared Google Doc. Engineer number three sends out a team email and engineer number four is fired. <laughs> Writing it all down doesn't mean anything if it's all in different places. What you need is a single source of truth. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, a single source of truth has a few key attributes. Everyone knows where it is. Everyone can contribute to it. It's searchable, and it's archivable. And that last one especially doesn't mean chat logs. Sorry, chat ops people. I don't want to go searching through HipChat or Slack for what broke two days ago. It has to be somewhere else. It has to be in a more specialized format. So New Relic Engineering actually uses GitHub for a lot of our documentation. We have a private instance, GitHub Enterprise, for this. Uh, we have GitHub Pages. It's like a Jekyll generator for company processes. And that's really great because anyone can open a PR on that to change things. We use GIS for like one-off configuration tasks. And we have repos just for run books, like that one I was talking about with the LDAP change. So engineering uses GitHub. And marketing uses Confluence. And project managers use Quip. And yes, I know these are all different tools. But the important thing is, is that they're all in one place for the people that need them. If you're in engineering, you know where to go. You go to GitHub. If you're in marketing, you know where to go. You go to the wiki. And as long as the people that need that information know where to go for it, it's fine if it's in different tools. <clears throat> now, at this point, you might be being like, hold up. Is this a documentation talk? 
because the first point was about documentation, and the second point was also about documentation. And Alice, do you know who I am? I'm an engineer. I work at web scale. I treat my servers like cattle. I don't have time for documentation. I don't have time to write it all down. Well, OK, yeah, you're an engineer, and you work at web scale, and you treat your servers like cattle. But interestingly enough, you know who's really into organization and documentation? Cattle ranchers. <clears throat> In fact, if you do a Google search for something like organize cattle or organize herd, you will get many hits for specialized software just for cattle ranchers to do such a thing. My favorite one is Cattle Max. <clears throat> this is real. You can get it on your smartphone so when you're out on the ranch and you've got data, you can just check things on your phone. It's got everything you need. Inventory management, performance metrics, and life cycle tracking. <clears throat> if you want to treat your servers like cattle, you need to be at least as organized as a cattle rancher. OK? Drop mic. End of talk. <laughs> so let's ship this. <clears throat> Why don't you take that whole DevOps thing to heart and actually make an app where people can find information in one place? I mocked one up, and I call it What's on Fire Today. <laughs> now, this can just be a UI front for Nagios or whatever you have running. It just, you know, I mean, who wants to look at Nagios, am I right? <laughs> just, just put this in front of it. Uh, bad servers float to the top, so you don't have to scroll trying to find problems. It's right there. And you can even add notes to let people know what exactly caused that server to go down. And again, this is just a great place. Anyone can look at it. Someone internally can make it to have a sense of ownership. And you can customize it to your needs. And it's one way. And it, Docs doesn't have to be just a bunch of words on a screen. It's really about knowledge. And as long as that knowledge is all in one place and people can access it, you're good. So let's move on to default configuration. So you're writing everything down, and your team is writing things down too, all in one place. But you also interact with other teams in your company. You're part of a greater architecture moving together. And how do you handle that? I mean, especially if you're on the operations side, you're going to be serving dozens of requests every day from developers that need something from you. I mean, how do you prioritize that? Is each one a different type of request, a different process? Or do you have a more of a set thing in place? I mean, how do you deal with that mm, turmoil? Well, I'm going to give you some valves you can put in place to kind of stem the flow and the stress of all those requests hitting you. These are things that we have in place at New Relic, and I like them a lot. The first one is the concept of the hero role. So the hero role started as a way for our development teams to work with support, because we had those language agents. And we have a one-to-one -one mapping between our language agent development teams and the support team. So you have a Python dev team and a Python support team. And it used to be if you were in support and you had a question from a customer or just trying to figure out an issue, you would just pick a developer and then just like harass them. Well, then we started the hero role. So on a weekly rotating basis, one of these developers would be the hero, and they would be the interruptible for that team, available for questions from support, so everyone else can be heads down. And this was such a success that we rolled it out to all engineering teams. So every engineering team, even ones that don't interact with support, have a hero role on a rotating basis for other engineering teams to interact with them. Think of them as like an API endpoint for your team. And this is great, because the rest of your team can concentrate. Everyone gets a turn talking to other teams, and it's fantastic once you get a new hire on, you know, let them get their sea legs and then just throw them into it, and you'll be surprised how fast they learn your architecture. Also part of the hero role are office hours. So depending on what team it is, they might be daily or weekly, but we've got office hours where you know where they're going to be, and they're there at the same time every day or week. And these are for tasks that are less urgent. So if you are coming to the operations team because you want to set up a new service, the hero might say, hey, is this really urgent? Can you just come here during office hours? And they'll be like, fine. And that gives you, as the hero, time to prepare and come to the meeting. And then you can sit down with them or remotely and help them roll out their architecture. And it really gives them that face-to-face -face time that they need and allows you to plan for it better so not everything feels like an emergency. We also have processes in place for our ticketing systems. So how many of you have some sort of ticketing system set up? 
Uh -huh. And how many of you just like to complain when other people don't do tickets right? Yes, OK. So you have a ticketing system in place, but you never actually thought to maybe train other people on how to use it. We have trainings, we have tools in place, and we have set processes. Like, for example, if people need user access to something, we require that their manager put a comment on that ticket to sign off on it. And that provides a good audit trail for our security team. And just having that in place means that things go a lot faster. And you don't have to ask us every time, how do I get access to something? People just know at this point because we've told them enough. Because after all, you are training people to interface with your team and your architecture. And if you don't tell them what's going to be happening, you'll end up with something like this. And if more people don't know what is supported in your environment, you're going to get a lot of snowflakes that you have to support. Don't let this happen to you. I mean, I don't care what it is. If you've got JavaScript on the front end and Go on the back end, whatever, just make a decision and tell people about it. So that when they come to you with you know, a Rust app, you're just like, I'm sorry, look, I know they just hit 1.0, but no, just go away. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a Rust app paging you at 3 AM, and you're going to be like, Jesus Christ. Just don't do that. Make sure people know what is supported and what isn't so they can work within your architecture, and you set those boundaries so they know how to interface with you and your technology. So again, what's approved? Languages, frameworks, tools. We were talking earlier about places to write down docs. It took us so long to get everyone on the same page. People are just like, oh, well, this new startup that I saw in Hacker News is cool. Why don't we just give them all our data? Don't do that. Just pick one tool, make that decision, and force everyone else onto it in the long run. It's a lot easier. And yes, they might complain about the save or the edit function. Well, you know what? If you're a big enough customer, that that company will eventually adjust to you anyway. And it's much better and much more prized in the long run to just get it down. So let people know what you support and what you don't. So here's another real world example. As I said before, we are running Docker and Prod and have been for two years. However, we did not have good documentation on how to use Docker for a year. We were just like, yeah, Docker, get on that, devs. And they were just like, uh. So we ended up with a bunch of different configurations out in there. And I actually sat down a year ago, and I actually talked to different people. And I was like, what do we expect them to do? How do you expect them to actually roll this out? You'd be surprised how many different answers I got. And I came up with very detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to deploy with Docker at New Relic. And we had on-build images and things they could download to make it as easy as possible to get them set up. And man, our Docker story got a lot better almost overnight. Now everyone has a better idea. They can go to some place to get a cookie cutter example. And if they have more specific questions, they've already read the docs, and they can ask those more specific questions of your hero, and everyone's on the same page. So that was a great idea. Should have done it a bit earlier. So let's ship this. I said before about our ticketing process and how we trained people. We actually recently rolled out an internal app uh, that allows people to just go in there and fill uh, common requests of site engineering out. This is just a, a Google Forms uh, app on Ruby on Rails. And basically, you go in there, and there are forms for user access, provisioning. I think we monitoring is there now, not provisioning yet. But you're basically just given this form. It asks you all the questions that we need. And on the back end, it creates a JIRA ticket with all the information we need. And then we can fulfill that request. Because before, they had to come to us and sit down with us for an hour, and we just repeated the same things over and over again about what we needed to see in that ticket. Now, we don't have to deal with that, and they don't have to deal with us. And frankly, who wants to deal with ops anyway? Uh, this is a lot better. And again, it's kind of a DevOps solution. We made a tool that, that caused a, an operation solution for developers. It went better for everyone. So stable distribution. So we worked on your team and how your team interacts with other teams, but that might just be within your office. And everyone knows that distributed systems are the new hotness. This is a photo of a distributed system in that you break something into pieces and people give you money. <laughs> Eventually, you're going to have to hire remote workers. You get big enough, remote workers are going to have to happen if they haven't already for you. And this is a good thing. A lot of people cringe when they think about hiring remote workers, and they shouldn't because remote workers are to your advantage. It ensures you get the best talent possible of those people that are willing to work with you. 
It ensures that you have regional connections, especially if you're an international business. It is so much more valuable to have someone in that region speaking to those customers, dealing with that culture, than for you to try and guess in a clumsy way like I do every day in London right now. And it allows them to actually uh, attend conferences and events that might be out of budget for you. So remote workers, good decision. You're going to have to do it eventually. But you want to make sure sure they're supported. So who here has been a remote worker? Yeah. Who here would do it again? Yeah. So I was also a remote worker. Here's a picture of me during that time. I did not enjoy it. And I didn't enjoy it for a number of reasons. I was originally in office with this company. And then I moved to Portland. And I was their first remote employee. And it went pretty bad. So why did it go bad? Why didn't I like it? Well, I was immediately left out. I took for granted all of the water cooler camaraderie that I had gained from being in office. And as soon as I was out of that office, I really lost that connection with my team and my other coworkers. So I was just culturally left out. My learning immediately plateaued. <clears throat> because it turns out, you don't know what new technologies to learn if you don't know if they, if they don't exist. So if I was sitting there, I could hear people talking about things, and then I could go Google them and teach myself at night. But when I was out of that environment, I didn't have any of the jargon, and I wasn't really aware of like blogs and things at the time. I wasn't that good on Twitter yet. So that was my only outlet and, and, and connection to tech, and I didn't have it anymore. And out of sight, out of mind, as soon as I left, it was like my manager sort of forgot that I was a technical hire and not a receptionist. So that didn't go very well either. But this can also happen in different flavors where someone moves away and suddenly you forget what all their skill sets are or that they're even there and maybe you should invite them to that meeting. Don't do that. Now, <clears throat> hopefully, your remote experiences aren't as bad as mine and the remote experiences of your teammates aren't either. But having a remote worker can be an invitation to a whole cornucopia of bad times and we want to try and fix that. Because I think the major theme here, and yes, I realize I have a Titanic reference in London. I'm sorry. Uh, the main theme here is we do not want to treat remote workers like second class citizens. Do not do that. I mean, after all, you want them to work for you, and you're fine if they're not in the office. That's how much you like them. They could be a psychopath in the woods with like T1 lines nailed to the trees, and you're like, great. So you, you obviously care about them, so you shouldn't treat them like they're second class citizens. So what are some things you can do to level the playing field? Take notes during stand-ups. We use, I don't know if you're familiar with the MIT project Hubot. It's a, a bot that you can put in HipChat or other chat programs. And <laughs> one of our engineers actually wrote a program that you can initiate it, and everyone feeds their stand-up notes to this bot. And then when you're done, it publishes them as an archive to a GitHub gist. And then everyone can just look at them on their own time if they're in different time zones, and they know what their team is working on. We also record meetings, all hands meetings, team meetings for people that can't make it. And we fly people in to get that face time. Fly them in once a quarter. Impress me and do it once a month. I mean, even video calls really don't get you that face-to-face -face time around the water cooler, people talking to you and remembering how tall you are and that you exist. You need to have that, even if they're OK working remote. We have the Matt Headroom approach. This is Matt. He is one of our remote workers. And he's just always on a laptop behind me, which is super creepy. Because he's just always watching you, and you forget he's there. And when he types, it sounds like bugs. Uh, but it's really great, because I remember that he's there, and like he's one of the team, because he is part of the team. <clears throat> and if I have a question about something he's working on, I can just go sit down next to him and talk to him face to face, instead of typing or even forgetting he's there and asking someone else that's not as knowledgeable about his projects. Just having that person there, even if they're on mute the whole time, is helpful for everyone. Also, make sure your remote employees have the same swag as your in-office employees. Hoodies, t-shirts, conference tickets, if you take your local team out to a celebratory lunch, you should make sure that you give a gift certificate or something to that remote employee for a local restaurant. Make sure that they are also included in your celebrations as well as the workload. Because I don't know how many times I hear about people just not 
Like they don't get the swag, they don't get the stickers, they, they feel completely left out. Like they're like, well, I, you know, it's a living, but they're not really part of the bunch. And having swag and the same, the same hoodies and whatnot really goes a long way to making them feel included. Because <clears throat> at the end of the day, you want them to feel included and empowered to work with the rest of your team. That's what it's all about. So let's ship it. Your next big project, give to your remote worker. If you cringe on the inside, that's your problem. That means your processes aren't in place. That means that you think, oh, they're not really going to know what that is. I mean, if it's within their skill set, then go for it. Because they will reveal problems with your processes. It will reveal problems with your team communication. And they will build those bridges and fortify those paths to making it easier in the long run. And you're only going to do that if you jump into the deep end by making them feel like an actual in-office worker and giving them the same responsibilities. So reliable under high load. We're almost done. Well, I am, but you're not, because now you have to actually grow your team. Onboarding should be as simple as bringing that person on, showing them to some docs, and giving them maybe a buddy to ask for questions. That is it. Anything else is a drain on resources. Yes, I had to use this picture. Because if someone comes on board and it turns out that <clears throat> the login that they need is in someone else's head, or no one on your team except the one person that's on break uh, realizes what they need to do to adapt to a new system, your entire team is going to be delayed. You're going to be down three engineers instead of one half time answering questions. And that's no good. <clears throat> Does anyone here have a concept of a first day commit or a first push? Hmm? One. So <clears throat> this is something that quite a few companies that I know about do. And it's the idea, hey, hey we just hired you. We want to get you off running and have you commit something, usually small, to your code base on the very first day. You want this person to be committing to your code base on the first day. It's usually something small like a documentation change. We usually do adding your SSH keys to Puppet so you can access our environment. And it's fantastic because it, it really feels very fast and it shows that you trust them. It's like, hey, we hired you. We know you're competent. We want you to be a part of our architecture now. We hired you to code now. And it goes a long way into really getting them into the team up and running. But if your first day commit or your first day push is more like a first week commit, then that does no one any favors. It makes your new hire feel frustrated. They might feel like, oh, everyone else did this in a day and it's taking me a week. Uh, it, it shows them maybe how little you value their time because you want them spending a week on trying to get Puppet working in Vagrant and it's just awful. It makes them feel maybe like this wasn't the right choice for me to come work for you if you can't get your stuff together. So make sure this is streamlined if you're going to do this kind of thing. Make sure you get them off the ground and running because it shows that you really value your onboarding process and you want it to go as smoothly as possible for your new engineers. <clears throat> so where to start with such a thing? Well, if you're a big shop, you might have your own training program already worked out. And you need to reach out to that team, and you need to get invested. I mean, it doesn't work if you have people going off and getting corporately trained, and you don't tell them what your architecture is, and they join your team, and you're like, oh, well, you're behind already. Good job. Actually train your corporate trainers on what your architecture is, on what you want your new engineers to know. Otherwise, you're not doing anyone any favors. And if you're a small shop, unfortunately, you're going to have to get creative you might have to actually write that onboarding stuff yourself. You might actually have to make videos. You might actually have to train people on how to work with new hires. But it'll pay off in the longest time. And eventually, when you get big enough that you have your own training team, you can give them the materials you've already prepared. And it saves you time in the long run. And some of you might be thinking, I know. I'll just have the new person take care of that. They'll come in. We'll give them a first day commit or a new thing to do. And then if they run into a roadblock, they can just write that down and make the documentation for me. Hey. Well, it turns out that's not very clever. And if anything, it just discourages the new hire because they really feel like it's a waste of their time. Like, really, you hired me. I don't know anything about your team. I'm really excited to be here. But now I have to spend days waiting through all these holes, trying to figure this out and struggling. That's a terrible experience. Don't do that. So let's ship it. I mentioned having an onboarding buddy. Have someone on your team know that they're going to be this new hire's helper about the week before that person comes on board. We have found that the best people to do this are actually your most recent new hires. 
Now, this might not work if you're big enough that you're hiring new people every day, but maybe choose someone who's been there a month and then have them be the new onboarding buddy because they were just there dealing with these issues. At this point in time, I am a terrible onboarding buddy because when I started, like there was a wiki page that walked me through how to get New Relic running on my laptop, which you can't do anymore. And I don't know where all these sign-ins are that you need these days. But the person who was just hired a month ago does. And it's way more, it feels better as a new hire not to be put with the most experienced person, to be put with someone who's in a similar boat to you. And can be like, yes, I know this is overwhelming, but this is what I had to do. And I'll introduce you to the right people and they're really nice and we'll do this together. So I have an onboarding buddy ready. <clears throat> So we've talked about five topics that were vaguely technical in name. But what they really mean is this. Share info in one place. Help other teams help you. Make remote workers equal. And make onboarding smooth. So for sharing info, we talked about pair programming and screaming birds. Make sure that you can share tasks and spread them out your skill, your skill sets to kind of build up those secondary skills. <clears throat> For all in one place, we talked about making an app because docs don't have to be just boring words. They can be uh, an application. It can be something cool, something inviting. For helping other teams help you, we talked about uh, making sure that they can interact with your ticketing system and they know how to interface with your team. And this application that we wrote that takes in their request via form and makes a JIRA ticket for them automatically. For making remote workers equal, give them a project. Make them feel equal, do that, do the legwork, because it'll reveal holes in your processes and your communication. And it'll make them feel more part of the team. They'll have to interface with other people. People will be reminded that they exist. It'll help them on their career and their promotions. It's just better. And make onboarding smooth. Give them an onboarding buddy to really help them out, someone who knows the lay of the land because they've just been through it themselves. Because at the end of the day, you want people to know that that meat for structure, that stability, comes from your engineers. And if your engineers aren't set up to succeed, they're not going to be stable, they're not going to be resilient, and they're not going to be able to build and support the technology that you need them to do, and everything is going to crumble. So thank you very much. <laughs>